Hello friends, the other day we had uh, an introduction to an essay of dramatic poetry by John Dryden. Today I will give you an overview because there are four persons, four critical positions, different opinions and so on, like a drama, you know, but it is not a drama. So there is a possibility that when you enter into it, there could be some complication you might develop in your mind. So to clear the whole thing, I would like to give you an overview of uh, the essay. Okay. <clears throat> so Dr. Johnson said about this very modern uh, quote, you can take this down. Dr. Johnson said, Dryden is the father of English criticism. The father of, of English criticism who criticism who first taught us who first taught us it is a very important quotation taught us to determine to determine upon principles to determine upon principles the merit upon principles the merit of a composition the merit of of a composition now this is a quotation by dr johnson but you can see something is hidden in this now. do you find something do you find T.S. Eliot here? Yes. Impersonality of art comes in here. Look at that. The idea of impersonality. This quotation by Dr. Johnson in the neoclassical age suggests the idea of impersonality of the art. Because here is not the person, not the biography of the person, not the intention of the person, but the father of English criticism, who first taught to determine upon principles the merit of a composition. That's what that's what uh, uh, T. C. also says in his tradition and individual talent. I hope you, can, you have taken this down. If not, please take this down. The father of English criticism, it was said by Dr. Johnson. Remark was made by Dr. Johnson. So, Dr. Johnson says about John Dryden, the father of English criticism, who first taught to determine upon principles, principles, upon principles, the merit of a composition. Understand? As I already said, it suggests that tradition and the individual talent, impersonality of the art. Okay, now we see what we find is. Is the what 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 is what is in this essay issues of literature in the late 17th century the tastes of cultured men and women of that period the taste what do cultured men and women want what do they require why do they go to the theater so these are the things that is that John Dryden is dis discussing here. And you can see, suppose this for making uh, uh, a wish, some making this visual, I would draw a circle like this. Okay. Is it a circle? <laughs> it looks like a circle. And then what is the issue? Issue, issue is drama. Drama. What drama? The great Greek. The great Greeks and Romans. It is classical period. Classical, classical. Then what else? Then you have got the you have got the French drama. French. Then modern. Modern drama. Uh, sorry, before that I'll say Elizabethans. Renaissance, Elizabethan drama or Renaissance, Renaissance, Renaissance drama. Then you have got a 
the French drama and moderns or contemporaries of moderns or contemporaries uh, moderns or contemporaries of uh, Dryden Dryden that is of neoclassical age second moderns or contemporaries of neoclassical age and then you have got the questions of the unities and the wine. The wine. So this is actually the thing that he is discussing. This is the stuff. Listen. So therefore what happens is, so looking at this you can see what are the issues discussed. See that classical drama, Elizabeth Renaissance drama, French drama and the modern drama. Only drama. I, I, the other day I told you, you know, that is uh, uh, the specialization in in I have four persons coming here. Isn't it? You there is an input by one person, there is another input, here is another input, and here is another input. There are four persons. Right? First is Critis. Critis. And Critis, as you know, who is Sir Robert Howard. Sir Robert Howard. And who was Sir Robert Howard? The brother in law of Neander, that is Dryden. <laughs> Neander or Dryden. I don't know. Yeah. An anagram, roughly an anagram. And then you have, sir, you have then Lysidius. 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 And that is Sir Charles Sidley, a Kentish baronet. Sir Charles Sidley. A Kentish, Kent, Kentish baronet. Means a lot. And the next one is Eugenius. Eugenius it, itself means well, well born. So that means he also must be a sir, isn't it? He's a Lord Buckhurst. Lord U C K H U R S T. Lord Bacchus. Eugenius? Now suppose this is only an imagination. And they are sitting on a barge, moving towards the mouth of uh, River Thames, with the head uh, gunshots reverberating in the sky and so on. So then, then what happens is that they, uh, they get into a dispute, a wide dispute. Started with a wide dispute. But it was limited to uh, dramatic voice. They started with the wild music, the entire thing, lyric and epic and all those. So, and another, in the when you are considering the war, another point to note is that Dryden is justifying, he gives specifications. What? Dramatic poesy is as great as epic poetry. That is also equivalent to epic. That is what he wants to establish. So he says there many, there are many points to that you must remember. To that. Understand? So then when I'm over you will get this. So you have got four positions, four critical positions. And this is the stuff discussed. What? The great Greeks and Romans, that is classical period, French drama of Corneille and, and then also you can say, right if you want, Corneille uh, C O R N E I L L E and Melier M O L I E R -E. So Cornel and Melier and then uh, Elizabethan so Renaissance drama, moderns or the contemporaries of Dryden, then are two other aspects that is unity and line. Unity is a time, place and action and also the opinion of Aristotle about that. Understand. So this is, I am just giving an overview. Now in this, again, one or two more points I will tell you, then I think it will be easy for you. 
Now, kaitis, what is his input? Kaitis is Sir Robert Hart. His input is, he speaks about the classical drama. Classical drama. And he says, how great those dramatists were. How great those dramatists were. So he is talking only about their merits. The Lysitis, he speaks about the French drama. French. And also he attacks, he vehemently attacks the English habit of tragic comedy. And he says, there is nowhere in the world you will find a theatre like this, that is English theatre, where tragedy is mixed with comedy and in two and a half hours time you have, you have gone through all the feats of bedlam. There is nowhere. So he is severely attacking. His attack is so merciless, so to say, he says, about tragic comedy. So he supports French drama because they observe all the unities, perfect unities of action, place and time. And then say that there is only one plot, there is no underplot as the English would say. Because if you have got more than one, these two plots, what will happen? Your attention will be divided. So he praises the French drama for two main reasons, three main reasons, one is negative. First is that the French, they have got only one plot. And secondly is that the French do not present tumultuous actions on the stage. And it is related or it is narrated. And third point about French drama, he says, first he said there is only one plot and the focus is there. Secondly, there is the one plot and then second point is that they, they, do, they have, uh, they don't, ah yes, present tumultuous actions, violent actions on the stage. See that? And the third is, they observe like the, uh, the classical others, all the three unities of time, place and action. Fourth is, they don't mix tragedy and comedy. So these are the four main points that Lysides uh, sub, uh, speaks in favor of the French. Understand? Then, uh, of course, Eugenius, he says, he is more important, he, is, he, gives, he speaks about English drama. That is the, uh, the Renaissance drama, the Elizabethans. And he says, now, Shakespeare's. Shakespeare's great genius, see that? Shakespeare's great soul and Ben Jonson's judicious observance of the unities. There is no other great writer of those when you compare anybody else with Dr. Jonathan, sorry, Ben Jonson, not Dr. Jonathan. Ben Jonson says there is nobody like that. And he praises natural genius of Shakespeare. So he speaks about Elizabeth Dillon, imagination. That doesn't much bother about the unities. And then finally you have got uh, So you see, look at this, the inputs. Kratis, his, this is, his identity is Sir Robert Howard. He speaks about classical drama, that is Greeks and uh, the Romans. Lysidius, he is the Sir Charles Sidley, a Kentish baronet. He speaks about the French drama, four points I told him. Eugenius, Lord Buckhurst, he speaks about the Renaissance drama and also Shakespeare and Ben Jonson. And then you have got uh, Neander. He, he, what does he do is he favors the moderns. He favors the Elizabethans. He's a critic of French drama. He's a French drama, one blot, no action. Only relation, relation means they are only narrating things and the unity says that it is like a statue, single plot. There is no life and so on. He criticizes, he does not attack on that. Shakespeare and Ben Johnson he praises, you see. Then he says drama is, uh, is drama is a legitimate form of poetry like epic, he says. So 
this is how, this is, and he also concludes that uh, about uh, rhyme, he says, I had fallen in love with the mistress rhyme, but now slowly I am saying goodbye to her, he says. <laughs> so he is becoming unfaithful to mistress rhyme. Then he quotes, Aristotle was saying that, what did Aristotle say? Aristotle said that it should be nearest to prose. The drama, the language used to be nearest to prose. They said a lot of discussion on rhyme because the, the, the opinion comes up that suppose you are in passion and you are emotional, then you, how can you go for uh, in search of rhyming words like hit, fit and so on. It should be nearer, which is an unnatural message. So these are the things that, uh, that unities is a very important topic that they discuss. Because classical unity, classical play, uh, writers, they, they uh, observe unity. The French, the French is praised for their unities. That's the most important thing. Elizabethans for their imagination. And then uh, Neander, he comes around and says, uh, he's like a moderator, we can say, Neander or Dryden. Now suppose these persons are only imaginative creatures in his mind. And all the four critical opinions are given by uh, Neander himself. Then what is, what, how does it look like? The whole thing looks like a mono act. <laughs> it's a kind of mono act, isn't it? Mono act, right? Because somebody, one person taking different positions. You have seen mono acts now. One person is servant, then he becomes king, and then he becomes a lady, and so on. So like that, I think this, uh, what is a proof, what is the historical proof that these four people, they were uh, sitting in, uh, sitting in a, on a barge and then going to, go to the mouth. There was the historical, uh, the incident there, there's naval action there. But that may be, I think it is uh, an imaginative, uh, not the naval action, but uh, the whole arrangement that he has made dialogue form, dramatic, to make it more dramatic, I think that he must have done this. And so, uh, I think that, I don't know whether I am a uh, character or not, according to me, I feel like that it's a kind of mono act. It's a one-man show, but to hide it from us that it is a one-man show, to tell us that it is uh, different opinions of different people, he, I think that he has, uh, made, he has put in his imagination. This, is, this itself is an imaginative uh, a discussion or dialogue and in that case it must be a, a mono act by the great critic that is John Ryder himself. And, uh, you may agree or may not agree with this mono act idea but it looks like that. Uh, there are, it, it, or you can think it in the other way also, there are four people, they were sitting and they were discussing, it's okay but four different particular opinions and also plus we have got the questions on rhyme and questions on unities. Understand? Alright, so what you find is from classical period to the age of Dryden, you will find the, the discussion. The end thing is on drama, nothing else. So that's what I said. In, if you miss this now, the original text, reading of the original text, if you miss, you, you will have missed half of the uh, literature or criticism on English drama or theory of English drama. Theory of English drama actually you will find here, right? Because it, it has got a, a diachronic perspective that is historical as well as a synchronic perspective. Synchronic means the present day, the given time. See, you have got, uh, for anything you have got, you can approach in two different ways. One is diachronic. Dia means through. Chronic means uh, time, chronometer. Once upon a time, the watch your wristwatch was known as chronometer. So diachronic means through time. That is history, historical study. But also synchronic. Diachronic. Dia means through. Diachronic. Through time. The other is synchronic. S Y N. You study language also like this. No? Two aspects. Diachronic, that's what we are doing in the history of English language. It's a diachronic study of his, the history of the English language. Synchronic means descriptive linguistics. 
what is given at the present moment you describe. That is. So in this way you can say this Dryden approach here you have got both. One is diachronic, the other is synchronic. Diamonds, you know the fact, uh, famous disease called uh, uh, diabetes. What is diabetes means? Just, uh, 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 just for the sake of general, I am saying that. Diamonds through beta. Beta means beautiful, sweet. So diabetic means sweet passing through. What a wonderful <laughs> situation is that, isn't it? Sweet, sweet passing through. That is the meaning of diabetes. See, daya means through beta. Daya beta, that is Latin. Uh, sorry, Italian beta means beautiful or sweet. So diabetes. So diachronic means through time. That is history. So this essay on of dramatic poetry is the next comes the essay on criticism. That is Alexander Pope is uh, making his comments on critics, on critics. But this is of poetry. That means the stuff that John Dryden is discussing is this uh, dramatic poetry itself. That's why it is of criticism. Of uh, poetry means possessive case, or you can say genitive case. Just now, the other day we we, uh, we in our sixth English language sessions we saw now. Uh, genitive case and so on, nominative, genitive, dative, accessory. So that is the difference between as a on criticism. That means on criticism all about critics he says. The Pope discusses, you know, how to be a good critic, what are the faults of the critics. Then he advises, his advice, uh, towards the end of the essay, he advises how to be a good critic. Faults of the critics, so the shortcomings and so on. This is what he speaks about. So it's about criticism as such. Not about creativity. This is about creation, creativity. You know. That is off dramatic poetry. The other is on criticism. Okay, that when you take up on criticism, Pope's Alexander Pope's on criticism, we will see the difference. The difference will be off. Or means this is possessive case. The dramatic poetry. The dramatic poet. Po what is the difference between poetry and poetry? Poetry is an archaic word. Means these days you, are, you don't use it. We started with poetry, now we are using poetry, that's all. There's no fundamental difference between poetry and poetry. I hope you, you know this already without my telling you. Right? So see you again. In detail, we will go into detail uh, the discussion and essay of dramatic poetry, different views of Critus, Lysidius, Eugenius, and Neander. You will see that. That is different views on classical drama, French drama, Elizabethan drama, and modern drama. That's all. And plus, line and the unities. Bye. See you again. Uh, have a nice time. Enjoy your life.